Uh, hello and welcome to Media Center Ukraine Odessa and we start our work today from the presentation of uh, film Under the Deadly Skies Ukraine Eastern Front and in our studio we have uh, Kaylin uh, Robertson, the director of film, uh, Paul Conroy, the war photographer and Zarina Zabrisky. Uh, Zarina, uh, please tell us more about your film. Right, and Zirina Zabrisky is a journalist, just to... Uh, so Paul and I are associate producers on that film. Uh, the film uh, was released early summer, first under the name Eastern Front, Terror and Torture in Ukraine, and it premiered in London, Hollywood, and San Francisco, and Kiev. And later on, uh, the title was changed to Under the Deadly Skies, um, Eastern Front in Ukraine by distributor. So far it did very well. Uh, it's screened in many countries uh, and uh, was selected by several uh, important festivals, including Cannes festivals, got some awards. What is this film? Uh, the film is our response uh, to the Kremlin propaganda, the Kremlin narratives uh, that were strongly supported by some voices in the United States, um, in the United Kingdom and Europe, that these this war is not real. As we know here in Ukraine, this war is very real. So we decided to go to Donbass, um, drive around Ukraine, go to Kherson, and speak to people on the ground to show Russian war crimes, to show uh, the torture that the Russian government uses as its state policy to incite fear, and to show the use of illegal weapons such as phosphorus bombs. And that's what we investigated. Having said this, I'm going to pass the word to Kaylin Robertson, our director. Thanks, Serena. Um, yeah, so I, I hadn't. Uh, ever set foot in Ukraine before um, before this film, which was done in uh, January this year, uh, and it was a completely unbelievable. Um, th it was it was it was it was an unbelievable thing to see what was happening here. It was unbelievable to see what was happening um, to the Ukrainian people. I remember when I arrived, there was lots of journalists who had already made films or news reports saying, well, there are two sides to this war. What about what the Russians think? What about what the other side think? And something I realized almost straight away was that there aren't two sides to this. When we're discussing what's happening in Ukraine, it is specifically Russian um, aggression out of nowhere and the, the genocidal uh, horrific behavior uh, that they've, that they've um, in inflicted on, on, on Ukrainians. Um, there isn't uh, a sympathetic side from what Russia is doing. It is specifically, um, it specifically the way that we covered the film, which is, which is war crimes and what Russia has been doing to people here. Um, and uh, it's, it's why when people talk about bias or balance in these things, the, the actual uh, balance that exists when making a film like this is um, war crimes are happening against Ukrainians. Uh, they didn't deserve this to happen to them. This country doesn't deserve any of the aggression that's been pushed onto it um, since the full-scale invasion. And the Ukrainians need to have as much uh, media representatives from, from the West uh, discussing this in, in as many films as possible, uh, with as much aid as possible. Um, but it was a very um, intense process. I had only arrived here to make a short film with John Sweeney talking about how many people had been killed since the start of the full-scale invasion. And when I heard stories from all over um, Ukraine that were being fed back to me about the atrocities that were happening in the east and the south, and then the atrocities that had happened uh, from the north coming down, um, I felt compelled as a filmmaker to want to stay and document it as much as possible. Because for me, it's the most important thing happening in the world still, uh, and it will be until Russia leaves Ukraine fully. Um, and the response has been amazing to have it on Apple, Apple TV, Amazon Prime take it. Uh, it's restored a lot of my trust in, in, in a lot of those outlets that they're still on the side of, of good. Okay, so I got here last March um, and immediately was struck by the, the kind of narrative being floated, not last March, the March before, um, by the narrative that this was Putin's war, that this was Putin doing the evil things. And I think one of the main things the film does is highlight no Actually, this isn't just Putin's war. 
It's easy to pass it back up the chain to the politicians. It's the people on the ground. It's the Russian police, as we saw in the film. It's the Russian military. This is systematic. This is not one man's doing. And then you follow the chain back up. As you know, the reason that they don't like this film in Russia is, you know, Russian as a state, as citizens, are not unaware. They're not living in China behind some great firewall where they don't have access to information. That information is available. And they are, by their silence, complicit in what is happening in Ukraine. And the only time you see the Russian people on the streets is when they're young sons are getting conscripted. You don't see them on the streets demanding an end to attempt a genocide in, in Ukraine. So I think the film nicely captures the balance between, yes, it is the Russian state that started this war, um, but it also highlights by just what happens when people are silent and allow this to, allow this to happen. So there's a, a lot of blood on a lot of hands out there. Right, and uh, our film is still uh, has the urgency. Only last week there were breaking news about the United Nations representative visit in Ukraine and going through the reports and um, uh, eyewitness stories of the victims and survivors of Russian torture. Uh, and uh, this United Nations representative confirmed that this is the state policy of the Russian Federation. Well, our film uh, broke it. Uh, in fact, I wrote about it a year ago ago after visiting the Kharkiv Oblast and liberated areas around the Zoom. And we've used the materials, we've used uh, the evidence and the stories from people in Kherson. We visited the dreadful basements, KGB basements, that were used as torture chambers by the Russian, um, uh, Russian police, Russian military, uh, Russian occupants in Kherson. And we show in that in the film way before the United Nations nations actually got to this conclusion. Also, the film is very important now because uh, the so-called quote-unquote peace negotiations uh, narrative is being pushed right now. And this is because Russia is not winning this war. It's not winning the conventional war. Uh, and um, our film uh, shows how these narratives are made. And to see how we do it, you'll have to come on Friday uh, to the Odessa Cinema Studio, Kino Studio, and watch the film with us. It is also streaming online uh, on Apple TV. Uh, Kaylin, help me here. So if you type in um, Eastern Front or Under Deadly Skies, anywhere into YouTube, into Google, you'll get all the results to be able to watch it in whatever country you're in. So Apple TV is, I think, in America, Amazon Prime is in Europe, but it's really easy to find just by typing in the name Under Deadly Skies. There's lots of reports about it uh, into whatever search engine you're using. I'm thinking. I have a question for you. How locals uh, react to your work, to your team on the front line, on the liberated areas? Um, I think they, you know, People in these situations, I've been covering war for 25 years, you know, so when you show up at a front line or a, a town that has just been destroyed, the one thing I noticed is that people, people who suffer together rarely sit and discuss this together because they've all been through the same thing. They've all had their houses destroyed. They've all lost family members. So when press show up with cameras and point them in the faces, it's a bit awkward for us because, you know, these are people who've suffered immensely. However, they also see it as an outlet, A, to tell their story, just to tell the story. There's no point in telling your neighbor because they'll tell you the same story back. So your presence allows people, it gives them a voice to tell the story. That also puts a hell of a lot of responsibility on you because if you're gonna stand there and say, Tell me your story. You have a, a you have an absolute heavy burden of responsibility to go out and tell that story as as often as well and as powerfully as you can. So I think the reception on the front lines in the front line cities that we went to has been as as expected as I've seen. This is my 19th war, and I see the same thing in a different language, time and time again. People need want 
to tell the stories, but you know, also it gives us a big burden of responsibility that I hope that in this film and in the next film we make that we, we live up to that responsibility. There was something as well that um, Zarina was talking about in the film when we went um, to a frontline village in the east. This was at a time where Bakhmut was still falling uh, and it was kind of, you know, the Russian line was getting closer and a lot of people were very nervous to speak to us because, as Zarina pointed out, if the Russians take this town, these people are going to be treated horrendously if they survive and if they have given any kind of interviews talking about how nervous they are about Russia because Russia hates free speech, Russia hates... Uh, journalism, Russia hates honesty, it hates all of this, uh, that they'll be, they'll be killed or they'll be tortured. So there's an aspect of people in these frontline villages who are terrified to speak, and then there's a number of people we found who really just wanted the world to know what was going on, even if their life was at risk by telling us, telling us about uh, how it's nonsense that they're Russian and that they f see these people as liberators or, it's, or, it's, uh, or wanting the world to know how scared they are and how much they hate the people who are destroying their lives and who are coming across the line. So that was, that was a really amazing um, thing of bravery to, to, to see from the, from the villagers. Um, and then a third strange thing was that uh, for a lot of people, they've been living with this horrendous violence. Uh, there's loud noises all the time. There's missiles coming into their villages. People they know have died. A lot of them haven't actually processed how difficult it's been until they actually said it out loud and no one has really maybe sat down and said, tell us about the situation, tell us about what's happened. And it's almost like a moment of therapy, a moment of realization for them, just how, how terrible things have been all in one, all in one place. Uh, and, and then they'll become incredibly emotional. And it's, so it's an incredibly emotional experience um, for them. Uh, but I think it's so amazing how brave they are uh, actually speaking in front of a camera, knowing that the Russians could, could, uh, could advance in their village. Thank you. Uh, as far as I understand, Paul have big war experience. Um, and I have a question for Kalian. Uh, is this your first war? Yeah, this is the first time in Ukraine, especially. This is my first time in Ukraine, but this is the first time I've ever been somewhere where there's active conflict like this, um, where there is a war going on. Uh, again, I hadn't intended on going to the east, on going to the south when I had arrived here. It was about documenting and, and talking about uh, all the number of people that, that had been killed by the Russians uh, with, with John Sweeney. Uh, so it was incredibly scary. Filming, um, filming this, especially having never been been anywhere, been anywhere with, with conflict. I, the first time I heard um, a missile or a shell landing was in Konstantinivka, and I literally jumped. The camera shook, and I said to, to John, "What was that?" And he said, "Well, that's an outgoing uh, missile. Don't worry. If it's going that way, it's usually a little bit safer. If it's coming this way, it's kind of a good noise. It means it's going in the right direction." Uh, and I hadn't even ever processed what an incoming or outgoing concept was and how they sounded differently. So that was just the first moment um, as we creep forward and got closer to Chasif Yar, as we got closer towards the, you know, the Bakhmut conflict zone. We didn't go all the way in there, but got close. Um, that was the first time I'd seen active you know, military equipment being fired. Uh, I've seen tanks on the road, speeding down the road. They make sounds like I never imagined they would. Uh, you know, and Zarina explaining the tracks in the road when you drive down a, a main road and it sounds almost like a World War II airplane bomber and just these very strange things. First time I'd heard the air raid siren. Uh, and um, it, was, it was probably only possible because Paul was with me, <laughs> uh, who has done this many, many, many times before. And I knew that I was in the best possible hands that there could be. Um, and he kind of really uh, kept me sane throughout the whole thing. There was a scene in the film, a moment in the film, where uh, a cluster bomb erupts over us uh, in a town in the east, and the noises are coming from everywhere, in every single direction, uh, and I remember uh, Paul had done a week of training with me before, and he just said, remember the training, get on the ground, lie down on the ground, and wait till it's over. And everything in my body was going to tell me to just run, run and chase. I saw a, a villager who was, who was running, and I said, maybe she knows where she's going, we'll just chase her. Paul was saying, if you get up, that's how shrapnel kills you, that's how you're going to die, so stay on the ground. And that's what I ended up doing. But I don't think it would have been possible for me to have done it 
without Paul next to me and without that training. Um, but I included all that in the final edit of the film because a lot of the time in these films, they're done through very, very seasoned cameramen, very seasoned directors, or seasoned people like, say, John Sweeney, and you just get the final shot of them standing on a hill with Bakhmut behind saying, this is what's happening behind me. And actually, it, you don't feel the risk through that, and, and, and that doesn't represent the, the risk that the, the people in those areas face every day. It doesn't represent the reality. So I included that aspect of fear that we had, that the moments where the camera was shaking and where I was questioning what was going on, because that is actually the reality of what's going on there for everyone that's living there, rather than just standing and, and talking about numbers and talking about which tank is which. So it was unintentionally part of the actual narrative of the film was what it's like going somewhere for the first time, inexperienced, making a war film. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul, you are the most experienced journalist, experienced part of the crew. Uh, what could you uh, recommend to other journalists uh, in Ukraine to, to, to act like? Um, to act like, I, God, I mean, I've been teaching as well as, as working as a journalist. Here. I've been running training courses for Ukrainian journalists and fixers for a year and a half now. I think we've trained 300. So I, I kind of inform them, and they kind of think it's quite ironic that I'm teaching them about safety because I was notoriously blown up a while back and I've done some incredibly dangerous things. And so there's this ironic moment where they go, why are you teaching us about safety? And I'm like, well, I'm still here, aren't I? So I go through the basics of, of, of teaching them about you know, hostile environments on the front line, how you know, just that as much as I can cram of the knowledge I've experienced, pass that on. Um, and that's different than the way a lot of people train. Most people get trained, UK journalists, foreign journalists, get trained by the military in the UK, by military instructors about how to be in a war zone. And what their military instructors completely fail to realize is that we are journalists and we have to be out there doing the job. So I kind of teach people the best safety protocols as I know them through experience, but also I bear in mind that we have to be out talking to people, otherwise we're just sat in a hotel. We were in one hotel in Kramatorsk, and the, the hotel owner goes, where do you go all day? And we said, well, we go out and we, we, we look for stories. And he said, most journalists who come here stay in their rooms all day and write about, and it's, which is a, a complete farce. If you're going to go to these places, you have to be out. So you have to take risks, you know, just by being there, by going out, by hearing a bang and saying, oh, let's follow that bang. You are, by default, taking risks. I try to teach, you know, the people we're with, you know, what I know about the risks of doing that. But you can't cover a conflict like this. You can do it two ways. You can do it with a military unit. Whereas you're safer because you have better intelligence, you have better that road's open, this road's open. But by being with a military unit, you are a de facto target. Full stop. If something falls on your head, you're with the military. It's to be expected. If you go without the military, it's another set of risks. You don't quite know which roads are open, which villages are safe. So you lose that degree of protection, but you're slightly less of a target because you're not all dressed in green with a big gun. Um, so, I just try to offer, and most of, most of this is common sense with a little bit of experience thrown in, um, but with the knowledge that we have to do the job and not just, if, if your job is, if your intent is to come out to cover the Ukraine war and stay really safe, then you're not going to get very many stories that affect people because to get the stories of covering war, you have to go to where the people are. It's not really about guns and bombers and planes and tanks, it's about people. And then people are generally the hardest to reach places. But that, that's what you want to hear. That's how you can take war and present it back to your country, other people, countries. But to get there, you have to take risks because the people who are most vulnerable also are in the, the most dangerous places. And, and that's something I learned with Marie many years, Marie Colvin, when I worked with her. We would just keep peeling back the onion layer, layer after layer after layer of a story, till eventually you arrive at the heart of the story. And the heart of the story 
is generally the most dangerous part of the story by default because that's where the women, children and vulnerable people are. Mm, thank you. Um, how, much, how much time do you spend on production of the film and uh, when we can wait for second part? So in terms of producing the film, it took about two months of shooting uh, and it took about two months to edit. Uh, I wanted to edit it as quickly as possible because um, this is all happening right now. It's very, very active. The, the, the stories that we found about uh, war crimes were still being uncovered and, it, and the torture that we looked at uh, was still just being kind of uh, figured out. So I wanted to submit it as, mu as, as, as quickly as possible because this is still ongoing. Um, and in terms of future projects, Serena. Uh, yes, we would be very happy to share with you that we are all set uh, to move on it, to the next project, which won't be the sequel. We don't really believe in sequels. It will be a separate film standing on its own. Um, it will be about and in Kherson, and for that we are planning to be based there. Um, I have been visiting Kherson ever since the Liberation Day, which was one of the most impressive days in my life as a journalist and a human being. Uh, I have never seen such a range of emotions that I've seen there with people stepping out in the streets with the flags, with the tears in their eyes. Uh, and that was the very day when the Russians started to shell and attack the city right away. And ever since, it was going on and on and on. And it's increasing, from what I hear, on a daily basis. And so part of the city is already ruined. It is also ruined by the flood. And we want to address ecocide that is happening in Ukraine as well. Uh, so through Kherson, in a way, through the very first day of the occupation of Kherson, through the horrible nine months of the Russian occupation, and then from the liberation and surviving the daily attacks and the flood, and now living uh, in this very fragile uh, situation with the uh, counteroffensive going on there, and we, we still don't know what is going to happen. This will reflect on the whole war of aggression in Ukraine. So we are very excited to move on and go there and start working with people, speaking to business owners, residents, people who survived the occupation, uh, people people who came back to Kherson, um, speaking to actors in the theater, which is still open and working. Uh, and we hope to bring you uh, soon, fairly soon, this year, hopefully, uh, God willing, uh, a brand new film that will go in depth on the beautiful city of Kherson. I've, I've got a mate, a director called Matt, Matthew Heinemann. He's made some amazing films. The last one was was retrograde about the American withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. And the, the thing I remember most Matt telling me about f filmmaking, he said, if you come out with the film that you went in to make, you're not doing your job properly. So we have all these ideas of what we're going to film, but when you get in and you find everything, it's like, oops, it's like, you, you come out with something else, and that's fine. You should keep your mind open. If you go in looking for this, that, 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 you know, you, you will get frustrated and you will end up thinking you're going a bit mad. You go in, you open yourselves up, you watch, you listen, and the film, the film really makes it, the, the direction of the film makes itself. You know, then you just follow it and you hoover up everything you need for it. But I do like that. You know, we'll probably come out with something completely different than we've just described, but that's okay because that's how. That's how good films get made. I Thank hope. Uh, maybe colleague have a question. Yeah. Michael Asher in Newsweek magazine. This is Kaylin's first war. It's Paul's 19th. Mm -hmm. And for Zarina, this is a war in your country. Uh, I, I'm an American, so. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm based here now. Okay. Still a relevant question, I think, for all three of you. And very related to what Paul was just saying. What surprised you most when you actually came here? I think, I think my, my very first impression was, was, the, was the attitude, because we'd all watched the build up to this in the UK. You know, we were watching Russian forces massing on the border. 
we were listening to politicians in the West, then we were listening to military analysts, all going, it'll be over in three days, no, nothing to see here. That, that was the general consensus, that Kiev would fall, the Russians would come in with overwhelming force. And many people were skeptical, but that was the general consensus, that this would be short-lived and brutal, but short-lived. And what amazed me was when I got to Ukraine, I think a couple of weeks, it was a couple of weeks after it kicked off, was just the, res the absolute, absolutely not attitude. Do you remember when Zelensky was asked if he wants a lift? And he said, I want ammunition, not a, not a ride. That, that, that spirit amongst the people. And I remember thinking, how does this, you know, because you're always, you, you, you're continually running through your head, how does this end, how does this, and then it got to the point where once they discovered the discoveries of Butcher and Erpin, and that was a turning point because I think then any concept of any negotiation or giving up or, you know, trading any land, that went out of the window. And I've never seen, you know, and it's one of the few wars they've seen where there's almost, you know, complete resolve to get this done, to, to, to withstand whatever is thrown. So that's, most wars I cover, you can kind of, you can, you can look down the road a year, two years in the future and see the end. You can, you can guess the end, you can work out the end, you can figure the end. With this, I can, but, you know, it's, it's just the, the, the thing that struck me was the resolve and the, the, the absolute, there was no sense that people were going to roll over and say, well, we have to accept this, whether we got the smaller army with a smaller country. You know, the West back and wasn't as upfront as it is now. So resolve, resolve and determination for me was the, was the thing that struck me most. Yeah, I think um, I came here with a, a fully informed opinion of Ukraine. I make films about Brexit, I make films about British issues, um, I knew there was a war here, of course, but I get my news from a, a, a big mix of outlets left and right, from The Guardian to The Daily Mail. Um, and it shocked me just how bad it was, frankly. I, 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 thought it, I thought things had calmed down by the time I arrived because news cycles had slowed down reporting on Ukraine or some of the right-wing outlets were saying, you know, that there was some sympathy from people in eastern Ukraine to what Russia was doing and maybe they weren't so terrified. And I just didn't know how bad it was until I got here, until I heard the sounds, the constant explosions going on 24-7 in the south and the east. Uh, went to the mass graves in India, Isium that um, um, Zarina took me to. Hadn't realized just how extreme everything had been uh, and still is. Um, and that was... At first, I thought it was a reflection on myself, and you know, maybe I'm just uniquely uninformed, but actually when I came back to the UK and told my colleagues, people in media, what was going on and how bad it was, they were surprised. They said, shelling constantly? Yes, constantly. You can hear it all night. It keeps everyone up at night. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a relentless campaign that's still going on, and people are still absolutely terrified, and people are still being captive in all these cities that are occupied, and they're still being tortured and killed en masse now. And that surprised even the people that I was working with. And that was, I think it's a failure of Western media entirely. It's also people are on social media now on TikTok or they're interested in their own things or think people's more vapid or they want to move on to more subjects more quickly. I don't know what it is, but that's what shocked me the most, how, how bad it was and how little I knew about that. Yeah, and as for me, I, I know because I have my accent, it's easy to think that I am from here, which partially is the truth, because I was born in the USSR, and having family from Ukraine and from Odessa specifically, I spent part of my childhood here in Odessa. So I had the warmest memories of Odessa. But I spent most of my life in the United States, in San Francisco, and I'm mainly a writer. A writer, and I started to do journalism about 10 years ago. Uh, this is my first film. Uh, the reason I turned to the film format, because I will turn to any format, really, that will help this country win in this war. So when I arrived here in April 2022, as soon as I got accredited, what uh, really struck me, resolve, as Paul said, but more specifically, the ability of Ukrainian people to self-organize. The grassroots movements here 
at the street level, at the flower kiosk level, is something I have never seen in any country, and I've traveled a lot. Uh, people put their energy, their efforts together um, to take care of injured uh, soldiers in the hospital, to collect money for the drones. Uh, there are some teenagers inventing the new drones. Uh, there, I, God knows, it looks to me like Odessa cats are convening in the yards to come up with ideas to fight the Russians. And it's very efficient, and this is what gives me a lot of faith uh, and a lot of enthusiasm, uh, and that's what was propelling me throughout this odyssey that we had a few months ago, uh, going through the mud, literally, and being stuck, that seeing how Ukrainians take it, and that the power of the spirit, uh, which is incredibly inspiring, and this is what I hope was reflected in our film, how inspiring people of Ukraine are. Thank you. One more question? Oh, you're done. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. I hope to see you again with your another presentation film. Oh, may I add uh, sure, sure, something? Sure. Um, actually, here in the media uh, center in Odessa, uh, there's a new exciting course for the local journalists that is forthcoming. Uh, and I was very honored to uh, be invited to read a short course on the Kremlin propaganda and fact-checking for journalists, uh, which I did uh, back in San Francisco and New York a few years ago. Uh, so we invite everyone who is interested to check out the information on the website for the Odessa Media Center. Thank you. <clears throat> Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it was a presentation of the documentary Under the Deadly Skies, Ukraine uh, Eastern Front. And we have in our studio Kaylin Robertson, Paul Connery, and Zarina Zabriski. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, and see you soon. What is that course going to be? Uh, well, actually, the person right next to you.